Where in the world is Tony Flo real? That is the question. I'm playing a game with all you guys. Uh, if you're watching this video of Flo Real TV, you can look behind me to get the clues on where I am in the world. My next guest is Mr. Kevin McNamara. Kevin is a 20 year veteran of the um, Australian Police Force. He is currently an immigration officer. I met Kevin through the London Real Academy where people get together to learn things about how to improve themselves in life from areas of meditation to financial literacy to how to broadcast yourself which was one of the main reasons I signed up for the academy. And in this academy, you meet amazing people that are all about improving themselves, being a service in the world and how they can be uh, amazing people making a difference. So I heard about Kevin and his story. What um, really got my attention was the fact that he uh, he lost his daughter, his first daughter, Holly. She was only five months old. And um, she died of sudden infant death syndrome. And uh, that was one of the first setbacks that, uh, you know, really uh, got Kevin initially early in his life. Um, he'd been through a couple divorces. Uh, recently, about three years ago, Kevin, uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer and through the uh, the natural means of uh, juicing uh, he was able to basically uh, heal himself of cancer without any sort of uh, traditional medical interventions so I heard about Kevin I needed to uh, meet the man that uh, I call the Aussie juice man uh, he was super cool, amazing heart, put me up, him and his uh, partner, Joy. We had a great time and uh, Kevin told me the story of his life, of how he's been able to overcome challenges and now he just wants to make a difference in improving people's health and wellness. So without further ado, enjoy this next episode of Flow Real TV with the Aussie juice man as I call him, Mr. Kevin McNamara. Hi everybody, this is Tony Flo Real coming to you from Cairns, Australia. Right across behind me is the Great Barrier Reef. Across from me is a guest that I flew all the way out from California to visit. It's Kevin McNamara. Welcome to Flo Real, Kevin. Pleasure to be here, Tony, and thank you for flying out too. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you for being a wonderful host. Pleasure. So I also want to get straight into like how we met. We met through the London Real Academy. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, yeah, it's one of the best, best things I've ever done is to actually join the London Real Academy. It's um, meeting people like yourself. And I've, I'm pretty sure I've changed in the few short weeks I've been there, just um, meeting people and seeing what Brian's all about. Yeah, and Mr. Rose. Mr. Rose, yeah, he's yeah. just fantastic. And uh, his heart's in the right place. And I love that. Um, he's doing it for the right reasons and that's why he's attracting people like yourself. It's fantastic. Yeah, awesome. it's great. So what's been like the biggest benefit that you've received since you joined the Academy? Uh, I think the biggest benefit is having someone fly out to actually talk to me and interview me. That's been an amazing <laughs> tone. It's just, um, for someone to do that, it's just, um, I'm in awe of you basically. It's, uh, just to get off your bum and actually do something and uh, take the stuff you've been learning from London Real and just get out there and do it. I know everyone at LRA there is really inspired 
by what you're doing, and that's certainly inspired me as well. So um, I've taken that on board. Uh, you actually sent me a message on Friday and said, oh, Kev, look, I'm thinking about coming out. Uh, I said, look, sure, any time. You said, what about tomorrow? <laughs> I said, hey, man, tomorrow's great. Yeah, come out. It's, uh, the weather will be good. Um, it'll be fantastic. So, uh, so, yeah, look, I've really enjoyed it. And um, I guess just meeting the people on there who are on the same sort of page as what I am, basically, who are trying to improve themselves, uh, trying to get better, develop themselves to become... Um, really empowering, inspiring human beings, basically. And I just love that. And it's great to meet those sort of people yeah, at long exactly. last. I've been searching for a while, so it's, uh, it's good to meet them. So that's, that's been a real plus for me, I think. That's great. And so the reason why I flew out was I heard your story that you had presented on a blog for London Real Academy. And uh, it was touching, uh, first of all, just to hear your background as a uh, officer, you had spent 20 years in the Australian police force and then after that for the last 10 years you've been an immigration officer. Um, but what really uh, touched me was just one, your story about losing your daughter, um, you know, to SIDS, sudden infant uh, sim death syndrome. Yep. Okay. And, uh, and then also just hearing about um, you overcoming cancer. So I want to first of all touch upon, um, you know, your just losing your child, your first child, your daughter, and uh, you know how how were you able to overcome that grief, grieving process? Yeah, I mean it's a, sort of a long time ago now, but it's, it's always with you, it always sort of stays with you, and I'm always sort of uh, I know she's on my shoulder basically, look, looking after me pretty much, little uh, Holly. She's only five months of age and um, wasn't sick or anything, really healthy little baby. And it was our first first child. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it just came as a huge shock. I was actually on night shift when it actually happened okay. in the police force down there in Melbourne. And um, I got home from work on the night shift that uh, finished at seven o'clock in the morning. I sort of went straight home and um, I sort of, I always, when I was on night shift, I took a little peep in Holly's door before I go to bed, just to sort of wave to her and stuff and uh, say hi if she was awake. And this particular morning, um, I went in and uh, peeked around the door and I saw she was awake and sort of moving around and her, her eyes caught mine. And this beautiful big smile came up on her face. It was just uh, amazing. And um, I think at that moment, I really felt the love that a man or a father feels for his daughter just seeing this beautiful smile and um, and a bit of a giggle and uh, so I had to go in and pick her up and give her a nice big cuddle and stuff and, um, and it was just a beautiful moment and that, that was the last time I saw her alive basically and um, put her back in gave her a kiss told her I loved her and um, yeah, it was really uh, just a beautiful beautiful moment and uh, went to bed and then a little while later uh, about 11 o'clock that morning I, I was sound asleep and my um, mother-in-law at the time was banging on the door, said, Kevin, Kevin, come quick, it's Holly. I'm thinking, what's, look, I said, look, Holly's fine. She's, um, I saw her this morning, she's fine. Look, just come quick, come quick. So I um, had to uh, get up and uh, I said, what's, what's wrong? She said, oh, look, she's down the doctors. And uh, I said, look, look, she'll be fine. She'll be fine, she's a great kid. So I went down there and um, the doctor called me in and he just said, look, uh, sorry, Kevin, we tried. And being sort of on night shift and half awake, half asleep, I was in this sort of a bit of a twilight zone, really. I didn't know what, what the hell was going. I said, what do you mean? What are, what are you talking about? He said, sorry, we tried. Then I looked over and, uh, and there was four paramedics around this table. And uh, they were around a baby on the, on the table there. And... Um, and then I sort of thought, oh, that must be Holly. So I sort of walked over and the, the three of the, the, uh, the paramedics had tears in their eyes, basically, which was really, uh, really sort of hard and um, hard on those guys as well. And um, so I wandered over and he said, I oh, would like to hold her and stuff, which I did. And um, but there, there was no tears for me. I, I couldn't cry. It just uh, it was like it was um, a bit of a dream, really. And so, um, yeah, I guess from there, 
my wife at the time sort of came in and, uh, and she was sort of, uh, yeah, obviously really, really um, distraught and whatever. And um, so we had the funeral and again, I couldn't cry at the funeral. I, um, I went and at the end of the funeral, I went and picked up Holly's casket, the beautiful little white casket and, and walked it out to the, the hearse there and there was still no tears. And uh, people kept saying, look, Kev, it's okay to cry. And I said, look, believe me, I want to, but I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't cry. My body just wasn't allowing it. It was just holding stuff in, I guess. And um, eventually I did cry about, uh, I think it was two or three months later, I was, um, I was on night shift. And uh, I think I told you the story about this. <laughs> it was um, back in these days, this was the late, late uh, 80s actually. 1989, in fact, it's a fair while ago now. And uh, back in those days, certainly in Australia here, and I'm sure the UK and America, you had the occasional beer when you were a policeman, when you were sort of uh, out on night shifts. And we'd been to a couple of parties and uh, and people loved the police back then. For some reason, they, these days, they're a little bit anti-police, but uh, sadly, but back then they loved the police and they'd, you know, have a beer, have a beer, okay, have a couple of beers and uh, ended up getting quite drunk that night. Which look, I don't, don't condone that sort of stuff. Believe me, not these days. But back then, it was that was just the culture of the yep. police force. So there was no no right or wrong about it. But that was just the culture. And um, got home, and I'd like I say had quite a few drinks, and um, got home, and my wife had uh, she was at work, and I got home, and I put it on. We had a little video of the old VHS videos of uh, of Holly at Christmas in 1988 uh, with all the family and stuff, and uh, we had. We got uh, Art Garfunkel's um, Bright Eyes song as the backing music to it. Beautiful song. And I put the put the video on, and as soon as it came on, I just burst into tears. I was just a total mess, and the tears just for those last two months just came flowing out. And um, so that was it. Was good to do that. Obviously, I, I needed to do that. And uh, even though I tried to cry before, it just, it just my body was just holding me back. It was just saying, "Don't cry." It mightn't be real, just don't cry, whatever, but something along those lines. And um, so eventually, yep, the, the tears flowed and um, you ask how you sort of get over that sort of stuff. We well, don't really get over it as such, but you learn to live with it. That's yeah. the, um, that's how it works really. Yeah. And I guess for me, I, I was lost for, for quite a few years and um, we had two children not, not long after Holly died. And, uh, and they're fantastic. They're in their early 20s now and um, they live in Melbourne and uh, they're, they're great kids, really fantastic kids. Uh, my wife at the time and I, we divorced and um, not long after the, the two other kids were born and uh, so it wasn't a great time. Yeah. It was just, um, look, it wasn't a fantastic relationship the whole way through and uh, but I won't sort of go on that but there's always blame on you know, both sides. And uh, but it was time to sort of move on, and so yeah, I was very lost for quite some time. And uh, eventually, I guess to cut a bit of a long story short, um, I got into meditation, uh, started experimenting with some meditation and stuff, and um, and that really helped. That really helped me sort of get through it. And I've always been fairly spiritual, sort of a person. I, I was brought up a Catholic, but um, I went off that. Uh, as, I was, as I got older, because I just didn't, uh, uh, just didn't gel with me really. Yeah. That's uh, this sort of fear-based thing where you know you have to do this, otherwise this is going to happen to you. So I just, I got out of the uh, religious part of my life, and uh, because... but it didn't keep you from being an atheist because you had mentioned uh, in our earlier conversation that you were always stunned by the awe of the stars and the galaxy. Yeah. Oh, look, when I was, um, I was probably maybe seven or eight years old maybe and I used to sit at, um, out in the garden at home and just stare up at the sky and uh, like daytime and nighttime and just look at the stars, look at the, the sun and the clouds and just wonder, you know, what's, what's beyond that? You know, what's, what's, what's it all about? Without really knowing that I was, what I was doing, I was just questioning stuff in my mind and, you know, what's, what's out there? What's, where are we from? And all that, all that kind of stuff without really going too deeply into it because I was only seven or eight years old, but I was always, um, there was always something there, some sort of spiritual side to me, I guess. And, um, and that's just grown over the, 
over the journey, I guess, with what I've been through and, um, and certainly with Holly, that really makes you look for answers. You know, you question, you know, why am I here? What's, what's it all about? What does her death mean? All, that, all these kind of questions start sort of going through your mind and uh, you blame yourself a bit as well. And so you've just got to work your way through it. And just um, and some people can't do that, sadly. They, they do struggle and they remain stuck in their grief, yeah, which, yeah. Is, uh, which is pretty difficult as well. Yeah. And I guess for me, it was just knowing that, um, listening to tapes, people like you know, Wayne Dyer and uh, Norman Vincent Peale, these guys from the, the, early, the early sort of pioneers of, I guess, self-help and self-development, uh, listened to a lot of them and uh, Napoleon Hill even, we think and grow rich. Mm -hmm. I read that book at the time, and um, so I, I began a search, yeah. pretty much. Which is like really just um, different from being in a, a police force, and yeah, oh, look, yeah. totally, yeah. You were yeah. not able to talk to anybody about these kind of deep things, huh? No, and I guess it was a bit of uh, incongruency throughout my life in many ways, like being in this job. That look, I enjoyed the police force, but. I knew, again, deep inside, I had this knowing that it wasn't what I'm meant to be doing, pretty much. And even working with immigration, as I still do now, although I've got the best job in the world up here because I have plenty of time off and uh, I'm on call most of the time, it's fantastic. But I, I still know that there's, there's a calling there for me to sort of be doing something, uh, and it's, it's starting to unfold very sort of slowly. But, uh, but yeah, look, the police force was a good job. And I certainly enjoyed a lot of it. I enjoyed a lot of the guys in it as well, and the girls. And um, but there was something missing, pretty yeah. much, and uh, and that's been going on for a while. And um, we're sort of getting there slowly but surely. And um, and certainly, as far as your question about how did I get through that grief, well, um, you've got to just just take stock of your life, and you've got to say, well, hang on, I, I can remain a victim, and I can feel sorry for myself for the rest of my life. And I know people who do that, and because they like the attention, oh, you know, feel sorry for me, come and see me, and you know, bring me stuff or whatever. Or you can say, well, hang on, it's my choice to take responsibility for my life, or I can just stay there and just feel sorry for myself and just blame everybody else, blame the government, blame you know, the weather, or whatever, blame God for losing Holly or whatever. And um, or I can say, well, okay, this is my life, it's my choice. I'm, I'm responsible for it. No one else is, and uh, I've got to stop blaming people. And uh, not that I really did blame anybody, but um, more I blame myself, I guess, more than anybody else. But um, I just took responsibility. And was there a pivotal moment where you finally said, you know, enough being a victim, I'm going to take responsibility? Yeah, like I say, I didn't really, I wasn't really a victim for very long. Okay. It was just a very short period of time initially when it sort of happened and I sort of I blame myself I guess and uh, but I guess probably certainly within 12 months I was well and truly looking at hang on this is it's my life I've got to work something out here and even though I, I, I didn't work anything out for a long time <laughs> I must say I knew that I had to sort of do something and change myself and um, just get out of that rut but there was no real was there a pivotal moment um, or it was just like a process that occurred over time and... Yeah, yeah. pretty much, yeah. And I, like I say, I was always fairly spiritual, so that, that sort of helped. Okay. That was always in the... That was always with me, yeah. pretty much, and that's, that really helped. So even in really the really bad times, like I went through uh, a divorce not long after that. Okay. So I've lost Holly, went through a divorce, got married again reasonably quickly after that, and then had another second divorce. And... Um, so that was a really tough period. It was a really yeah, tough sort yeah. of 10 year block there, sort of losing Holly and then two marriages sort of breaking up. And, and where in that did you start the support group for people that had lost their uh, child? Yeah, it was probably after, after I'd been through all that. That sort of came, um, that was probably, um, I probably started that, oh, geez, let me think, maybe, five, six, seven years ago. So it was, it was a fair while after okay, that it right. all sort of happened. But um, yeah, it had a bit of a support group, a Facebook page and that kind of stuff on um, and a website uh, for mothers who had lost a child, basically. Just, just 
me being there for them and um, just talking about it and they would often message me and just, you know, some of them in tears and stuff, you know, what can I do? And just, just guiding them and just letting them know that, you know, your child is always with you in spirit, basically. And they're going to look after you, they're going to hold your hand and they're going to look after you on your journey. That was my basic um, story, really. Yeah. That, and that sort of helped people a lot. And um, yeah, so that, that was good there for quite some time. I, um, I enjoyed sort of helping. Yeah, it's so also one thing that I always noticed about you um, just in the short period of time that we met is that you're just so like giving and uh, you're always wanting to like help people. And before we get more into that, but I want to talk about um, your other challenge after that, having to overcome prostate cancer and how you were able to heal yourself in non-traditional means. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um... Geez, when I think about it, Tony, I've been through a lot, haven't I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what am I still yeah. doing here? <laughs> and, and you had this spirit about you that just struck me as why I flew all the way out here because I actually wanted to, to be around your energy and see how is it that you're able to maintain that positivity despite these stories that you have. Of, you know, I'm, I'm thinking multiple rock bottoms. Yeah, look, you're, yeah, look, you're right. And... Um, yeah, um, yeah, with the prostate cancer uh, that happened about three years ago now, and um, I guess I I had a funny feeling beforehand that some, something wasn't quite right, sort of with my with my urine flow. Actually, that was what the that sort of slowed down a bit. Um, so that's one of the symptoms. Yeah, yeah, you're not sort of uh, and look, it's a big, uh, it's the biggest. Um, Prostate cancer is the most common sort of men's cancer, basically, which yeah. people don't realise, and it's, it is very, very curable. I mean, you hear a lot of bad stories, but um, it is very, very curable, and um, unless it's totally taken over and you, you get it at a really late stage, well, um, you can definitely uh, live through it. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Okay. Even, like, even with or without medical intervention, basically, is what okay. I'm trying to say there. So it's not the the big evil scary thing that, that people think but um it is scary but uh yeah. um so i was diagnosed with this i went and saw the um, a doctor and my psa levels were up and uh, that's something you'll i won't bore you with the details about that but um that was a bit high so i went and saw a urologist and he performed a biopsy um which isn't overly pleasant but um and then what happened was I was in my job with immigration at the time and I'd been seconded, which means I'd been asked to go and work for 10 weeks over in Western Australia, over a place called Curtin, which is like an Air Force base, been converted to an immigration detention centre over there. So um, I'd been to this urologist, hadn't got the results back as yet. And then I flew over to Perth, which is about a five hour flight across the other side of Australia from where I was living at the time. On the Gold Coast, and um, my, my first day there, so I was away from my partner Joy, who is a lovely lady, as uh, you've met yourself now, Tony. And um, so I was leaving her for ten weeks, which which was hard enough as it as it is, just have to leave her and uh, at home and um, go and do this secondment over there. And uh, the first day there, I get a phone call from the urologist, and he says, "Oh, look, I've got some bad news for you. You've got." Uh, it's only about five percent, but you've got um, you know cancer of the prostate. So I said, oh, okay. And it's funny. As soon as he said that, I mean, a lot of people think, um, oh God, I've got cancer. It's a death sentence. It's this. It's that. And if they've chemo or this or that. I mean, my first thought was, okay, that's fine, but I'm going to beat this bastard. Basically, mm -hmm. this thing that's trespassing in my body. It's not going to stay there. It's going to go. And I, I just knew from the moment he said that, that this is going. There's just no way because I'm, I'm, I was fit. I was healthy anyway. I wasn't sort of unfit or, you know, overweight or anything. And, um, and so I thought, I'm going to beat this thing for sure. It's just going to go. And he wanted to have it sort of removed and stuff. And um, look, the hardest thing for me was ringing Joy and telling her okay. who was back home. And I was sort of, you know, four or five thousand miles away or kilometres away over in Perth there and would be there for the next 10 weeks. And here I am telling her that I've got cancer, basically. And um, so she took it probably harder than what I did. 
actually the whole thing. She was um, took it really hard, but but being away uh, for so long was probably a good thing, as it turns out, because if I was at home, I might have gone back to the doctor. He might have convinced me to have it cut out or whatever. At least this way, we could have we, we both did some research. Myself and Joy did some research, and um, Joy went and saw a guy named Don Tolman, who is uh, they call him the Whole Foods cowboy, and he's uh, a guy from the U.S. who wears a cowboy hat and got a big sort of uh, mo down here, and um, amazing guy. And he's he's studied sort of health and wellness for 40 years. He's been over to Egypt and all these. Um, different um, ancient cultures studied them and how they, they've survived stuff and all the really natural whole foods that they've eaten over the years and um, amazing guy. So we did, did some research. I came back, went and saw another doctor and she said the same thing. Look, let's just cut it out. Mm. Cut your prostate because you, you're still pretty young and um, I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. I mean, there's a lot of nerves attached to your prostate for you guys out there. <laughs> And once they start interfering with that with surgery, well, you just don't know what's going to happen. So it, it can really affect you. And um, I just thought, no, I just don't want to do that. That's just not going to happen. So um, I went along and saw Don Tolman. He was doing a tour of Australia and um, went to his seminar. And he was fantastic. Taught me so much about health. Um, and I, I went and spoke to him afterwards. And he was just great. He put me on this uh, particular protocol, like a diet. For my uh, for what I had, uh, and I, I don't call it my prostate cancer. It's just prostate cancer because uh, once you own it, mm. well, that's not, that's not not a good thing. I don't think Tony. Once you actually own the the disease in you, okay. it becomes part of you. Oh, okay. So for me, it was just it was prostate cancer. Well, it wasn't my prostate cancer, mm. so it was time to sort of get that trespasser out of there. Yeah. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, we're on this protocol, some rolled oats and stuff and a lot of uh, raw food and juices, the, uh, the beautiful Kabbalah juice that you've had yourself, yeah, had a lot of that stuff. <laughs> and, um, and after three months, uh, my urine was flung like a fire hose again. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> Went and had some checks and I was, I was cancer free. Wow. After just three months of just following Don Tolman stuff, it was just amazing. And uh, I... I went and ran my first half marathon not long after that. Wow. You're a big guy. Big guy, yeah. <laughs> Running a marathon, that's impressive. Impressive. Yeah. And, um, half marathon. Half marathon, yeah, it was a long way for me, I'll tell you. Yeah. A long way. Still a long way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely. And um, look, I, I go to the gym, I you know, do running and stuff. I'm doing the hill sprints the, uh, every week and uh, I'm, I'm probably healthier now than I've ever been. And so I guess my message with that is um, you can really overcome any disease in your body or any affliction you've got just through eating sort of, you know, fruit, veggies, uh, fasting, um, you know, lots of juices and stuff, fresh air, sunshine, exercise, just, just the basics of Mother Nature pretty much. So did you have that lifestyle before you had prostate cancer or what, what do you think was going on at the time that brought that on? Well, I think for me it was, um, look, I, I was eating pretty well. I wasn't eating badly and I, I was still exercising. I was running and stuff. Okay. So um, that wasn't an, an issue as far as the health goes. But I had been, had been on uh, about 17 years before I was put on blood pressure tablets. Okay. And I went to my doctor and um, I forget how old I was, but it was about 17 years before that. So whatever that was, but um, went and saw her and she said, look, Kev, your blood pressure's going up a little bit. Um, so we might just put you on these blood pressure tablets just to sort of, you know, just to plateau that out a bit, just so you don't, don't get too high and it becomes dangerous or whatever. And being my doctor, I said, oh, okay, that's fine. And she said, look, um, once you're on these tablets, you can never go off them. And if you go off them, you could die. I'm thinking, oh my God. And like, this is my doctor telling me this, so you believe your doctor, obviously. So um, I said, okay, yep, I'll go on them, that's fine. And uh, so for 17 years, I was paying, you know, about 50 bucks a month for these pills. And, um, and I, I never felt right on them. Even all through those years, I just felt something wasn't quite right with it, just doing that for all these years and being so young as I was then. Um, 
and it just didn't feel totally right. But I, I kept taking them because I was scared that if I stopped taking them, I'd die, basically. And um, anyway, and I'd met Joy by this time, and um, we met back in 2008. And um, so when I had this secondment coming up, I was trying to work out, I had to go and order all these blood pressure pills to take, to take away with me. And, um, and she said, why don't you just stop taking them? <laughs> I thought, oh, well, I might die. And she said, you won't die. Look at you, for goodness sakes. You're healthy, you're running, you're exercising. You're not going to die. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm being a bit of a dickhead here <laughs> just by taking these tablets. So I, um, when I went away, I just stopped cold turkey taking these tablets. Wow. And wow. Um, I thought, stuff it. I'm just not going to take them. And got off them. And uh, I'm still here. Yeah. So how long were you, were you taking them? 17 years I was taking those. Wow. Wow. And look, I, I've got no doubt that the uh, the toxins there's toxins in in all sorts of pills. There's poisons in them. Yeah. And that had some sort of effect on my prostate. Like, oh, I've got no doubt about that. Okay. Because to have stopped taking them, and then in three months had the cancer just disappear. I figure, well, that's got something to do with it. I've got mm -hmm. no doubt. So, um, and again with blood pressure. It's something that uh, a lot of people have and they're on pills for it and stuff. And um, I can only give you my experience, but I know ruby red grapefruits are fantastic for blood pressure. You take one of those a day or even three or four a week mm -hmm. and that'll fix up your blood pressure. Yeah. Don't take them with the pills because they don't sort of mix. But um, yeah. my advice, I guess, to people, um, look, I'm no doctor, so uh, a bit of a disclaimer there, but um, being on pills, you're making money for the big pharmaceuticals. Don't worry about that. They're making big dollars out of it. And they want to keep people sick so they can keep making money. That's what, that's what it's all about, in my opinion. And, um, but you can hear yourself through, certainly through uh, pineapple, ruby red grapefruits, any sort of fruit will help you with your blood pressure. Okay. And um, that's... Totally to make it clear too, you're not anti-doctor either. You you do believe that they are useful for well, emergencies. Emergencies like hospitals and stuff are great. If you're in a car accident, you're all busted up. Yep, first aid, fantastic. Go and see them. But anything else, I really um, I, don't, I don't go and see a doctor anymore. I just don't go. I just eat healthy, and I know my body now. You so if there's absolutely if there's something going on. I'll know, and I'll know what to do. When the knees are sore, I'll need some more turmeric and ginger in my juices, basically. That fixes up my knees, my sore back, everything. A great anti-inflammatory. So, uh, boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 <laughs> exactly. That's, and it's, it's, it's worked for me. Like I say, I can't um, speak for others, but for me, certainly, that's really helped my life, yeah. definitely. And it's, it's cured me, and um, I can't speak highly enough of Don Tolman. He, he really saved my life in many ways, and, um, so you've yeah. been on this lifestyle for the last three years or so, or? Yeah, like I say, even before that, I was still eating healthy. Okay. Um, so it wasn't bad, but I was yeah. probably, say, 60% good food back then, and maybe 40% not so good. Okay. Whereas now I'm more, I'm closer to sort of 80%, the 80-20 rule, you know, Pareto's law, 80%, uh, really good food, and 20%. Maybe fun. not so good. Yeah, fun, fun sort of stuff, like yeah, like, like like chips. Yeah, yeah, chips. And stuff like we had yesterday French with the fries. French fries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you, you can do that when you're fit and healthy, yeah. and uh, you don't need to be rigid yeah. with your uh, with your exercise and your uh, and your health and stuff. If you're um, if you're eating well and you're exercising, you can sort of have the occasional pick out. I mean, don't really don't become too rigid that you just um, life isn't fun. Like one of the rules of London Real. Hey. Yeah, Got to have fun, yeah, yeah for sure. So what are you doing now with uh, the lifestyle you're pretty much sharing, educating people about your story and what they can do to have more energy and vitality and be healthy? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a couple of websites or a couple of YouTube channels and, um, and one of them is Smiling Body, Smiling Mind that I guess is about health and wellness. It's got some uh, recipes on there and uh, stuff about meditation and a bit of inspiration, that kind of stuff. And the Kevin Spies TV that I'm sort of uh, going to ramp up a little bit now after uh, London Real and Tony Flow Real. Uh, that's more about just, I guess, uh, telling my story and trying to inspire people to be the best they can with what after what I've been through and. Um, 
just to let people know that you can, it doesn't matter what happens to you, you can really, uh, you can still lead a great life and be happy and, uh, and inspire other people. Tell people your real age is 135, right? <laughs> Feels like it sometimes, Tone, but uh, after a half marathon it does. But um, now look, I'm 57 and uh, feeling fantastic. Wow. Yeah, I feel about 25 and um, yeah, so I've, you know, I mean, age is no barrier to anything yeah. for me. It's just, um, you just got to love life. Uh, it's going to throw some curveballs at you as, <laughs> as we've all been through. And uh, you just got to look at it and say, well, okay, it's, it's my life. I'm responsible for it. Don't blame other people. Don't... Um, don't turn, turn, don't turn into a victim, is what I'm trying to say, um, because people, they get sick of victims and uh, they become a bit of a bugbear and uh, you'll lose more friends than you'll, you'll make with uh, becoming a victim. And if you're real and you're out there and you're telling a story and you're helping others, well, that's, you know, I just enjoy doing that. That's what uh, inspires me and hopefully it inspires other people as well, so. That's great. And in the past you have tried to do uh, charity work and so just kind of share with people your experience with that. Not that it's going to stop you from doing that in the future, but working with these big organizations, you kind of saw just like what big farm pharmaceutical is all about. You saw what big charities are about as well. Oh, look, I did, yeah. Early in the piece, it was around about 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. Um, I wanted to do something for Holly. And so I organised a, a charity fundraising event. And it was called uh, the Big Red Ride. And I'd actually, I'd hired or had, had sort of, not donated, but they offered to do it for nothing. And uh, I'd pay for the petrol for the big, uh, big old London double-decker bus that we got a hold of. And we got some stickers made up. We were going to go to um, Australia Zoo, Steve Irwin's um, Australia Zoo, which you may have heard of. We were going to call in there at one stage and um, call into a few hospitals. So I'd, I was ringing and I was emailing a lot of hospitals to uh, get a bit of support and uh, see if we could come around with the, uh, the big red bus and uh, talk to the kids there. It was to raise funds for a children's cancer charity. And um, amazingly, some of the hospitals I rang, they said, um, are, you, are you going to be raising funds for us? And I said, well, no, it's for the Kids Cancer Institute. Oh, well, well sorry, you can't come and see us then. They just sort of said no, and I thought, well, we want to bring some happiness for the kids. I mean, what's, what's more important, the kids or money for your hospital? It was just, um, and I had, had quite a few of those phone calls. It was just uh, where I felt really, wow, this is how charities really work. They just, and hospitals work, they just, unless you're doing something for them, they're not prepared to put themselves out and really sort of help you out. So it was uh, it was a big wake-up call for me, and, um, and along with that, there was, then the bus people uh, decided that they wanted uh, ten or sixteen thousand dollars for the bus and stuff. This is halfway through the trip, and I'm thinking, what what's going on here? Why am I attracting this crap into my life? My life this drama. And then there's a lady who uh, was organising some raffles and stuff, and then she's hit me with a four thousand dollar bill for just arranging a couple of raffles. And um, so it turned out that um, a lot of it I was going to end up sort of paying more for these people than uh, what I was raising for the kids. And it was just, um, so I'd, I'd, I refused to pay for the bus because the guy had told me, look, just pay for petrol, we'll come along. Another little story about that, uh, we're at the, uh, at the Kids um, Cancer Institute Hospital. We were raising money uh, for them and um, the kids were gonna come down and see us all, and we had some little presents for them and stuff and that kind of thing. And, um, and, I, and the, the guy who, owned the bus and drove it and his wife came along as well and they were both chain smokers and I said to them look uh, would you, you guys mind not smoking around the, the kids because it's at, at the hospital now and blah 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 and they said Kev you're paying us just to sort of drive the bus not to not to stop smoking and I thought what the what, what is going on here why uh, why are people like this it was just um, it was a crazy trip and I got back from it and I was just totally stressed out and I thought, this is just, um, I will never do this again. This is just madness. It was, um, it, it really sapped me of energy and life and I spent a week just staring at the walls pretty much after that. I was just really, um, 
it was a, it was a lesson about life and um, about what you know some charities are there not so much for charity but just to help themselves pretty much and, uh, and also people with their own agenda yeah absolutely absolutely so look it was look I'm, I'm not bitter about it I was for a while there but I've since sort of moved on from that and um, again that's you, you take responsibility for it it was my idea so I'm responsible for it it wasn't fantastic didn't work out that well but hey I did it and I've learned from it let's just move on move on to the next thing so that's what life's all about for me yeah so one of the things I like to ask my guests on the show is can you think about a pivotal moment in your life where you experienced like flow states where you've had these moments where time slowed down and either sped up um, you felt superhuman you felt your best um, um, sometimes they call it like being in the zone in athletics even in emergency situations with you having the background of being in the police force uh, immigration is actually uh, uh, having to like go in there and uh, tackle a uh, a, um, a illegal uh, immigrant yeah <laughs> yeah um gee, let me think there's probably been a few times there um when i mentioned lying on my back um as a kid looking up in the sky i was in, in that zone i was really in the zone there it was just i thought wow look at those clouds look at that sky what's behind that and i was really there i was just totally present in the moment and it was um, a pretty amazing experience for someone so young and i guess um the time you mentioned where i was at work at immigration and uh this huge well short guy but just very very stocky south african guy got hold of some drugs in the center there somehow and uh, look it happens all over the world in uh, jails and stuff but he got hold of some drugs and he was going crazy and we had to put him in this um well isolation cell basically and um, he went in there and he just ripped up the uh, the sink that was in there ripped up the toilet there was just water going just flushing into the um, into the room or into the cell it was getting quite high so we had to go and put our uh, riot gear on and as soon as the door opened to go in I was in that zone again I was just totally focused because you have to be um, this guy was like a like somebody on ice who just goes becomes really really strong and um, even with five of us there we knew it would be a battle but um, so I just went in, into the zone and just straight in and we got him and um, worked out fine but that was a time I was certainly in the zone and there's been times playing sport um, times I'm out running you just get in that zone talk yeah. about like runners high and yeah especially running around where I live here with the with the ocean and stuff yeah. the nature is so beautiful out here it's yeah. incredible absolutely and uh, I'll just look at the ocean and uh, I'll just give thanks to the universe for this amazing place I live in and just for my life basically um, even though you go through a lot of crap in, in your life but um, I mean life's beautiful it's just um, when you set your mind to it and like I say I'm big on responsibility it's your life so you choose how it's going to turn out not somebody else and I'm just so thankful to have the life that I've got and the partner that I've got the kids I've got the place I live in so you always had this attitude or is something you developed over time? Um, I've become more aware of it, I guess, Tone. Um, in a lot of ways since I met Joy, in fact, that's um, because she's very uh, spiritual. I learned a lot about meditation through her. Um, so yeah, your home is beautiful. I mean, the energy in here is, when I walked in, it was it's just, I could feel that, that yeah. peaceful, loving vibe. There's crystals everywhere buddhas and uh you know beautiful uh phrases like love and a lot of awesome quotes on the fridge yeah. beautiful pictures of your family yeah yeah it's um yeah i think i've like i say um i don't know whether you sort of develop that or just become aware over time or more aware like the, the more you meditate the more you become at ease in your body and what reflects inside reflects outside again rather than most people having the outside world um, whatever's happening there affects them inside and once once you learn how to really control the inside the outside just takes care of itself 
and um, once you can really feel at peace inside yourself, and you, the peace is already there. We all have peace inside us. As soon as we're born, there's peace there. And unfortunately, as, as we grow up, we go through school and jobs and stuff, and it can get beaten out of us, and um, we lose that sort of uh, connection with nature and, uh, and the universe, basically. And uh, I think meditation is a great portal to get back that peace. And um, I think if everybody in the world uh, meditated, it would be a much better place. And certainly, I guess to answer your question, my attitude to that is uh, it's always been there in the back of, not the back of me, but in the back of my, what am I trying to say here, Tone? It's always been a part of me, I guess, yeah, this, right. uh, this peaceful sort of uh, part of me. And um, you're, you're to me, you're a very gentle giant, you know, but I, I wouldn't want to piss you off either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, you know, um, there's been times in the police force, obviously, that, you know, you've got to sort of really become aggressive and that kind yeah. of stuff. And, you um, said that you actually like enjoyed the adrenaline part, that yeah. that was like a fun part of the job. And yeah, look, absolutely. Like when you're, you know, in a, in a pursuit, you've got the lights and sirens going, uh, you're really in that zone. Because you have to be, you have to be alert and totally switched on to what's happening. You're chasing a stolen car, or you're chasing some burglars or whatever. You have to be switched on and just totally in that zone. And look, it's it is good fun, in in a strange sort of way. It's uh, it's exciting because it's gets the adrenaline going, and you really feel like you're, you know, you're again present totally in the moment because you have to be. Of <laughs> course, if you're not, you could be in real strife. So uh, like I've had it. Been a couple of chases where the cars have crashed and um, we're not sure whether they're going to jump out with guns or knives or whatever. Or So you need to be alert and sort of really switched on. Otherwise, um, it can be very uh, disastrous. Yeah. So. so let's segue into the uh, part that we're talking about. Um, a lot of people these days are becoming information junkies. And uh, you and I have talked about uh, collaborating and, and working with um, people in, in a really non-traditional way. So touch upon, you know, some of the things that we were discussing. Yeah, sure, Tone. Um, I guess we both, um, it turns out we both have had different thoughts without knowing it, even without even knowing each other at the time. But um, I've often wanted to do some kind of a, a retreat or something like that. Um, or a weekend or whatever where um, people just come over and they just hang. They just hang out with us. Um, they just look at our lifestyle. We have juices in the morning, uh, some porridge or muesli, whatever you want to have, um, some nice fresh fruit and um, eat really well for the weekend. Um, go for walks, uh, go out there with the, um, take the kayak out, paddleboard out, have a bit of a swim, go for a walk, watch the turtles, um, hopefully see a few dolphins, um, that kind of stuff, and talk to people, come back, have a bit of a, like a focus group type of thing, um, and people who want to air their issues, we can talk about stuff, and, um, and the people who are running the, the retreat or the seminar, whatever you want to call it, can give their feedback as to how, how they sort of got through those particular issues, and, but in a very relaxed manner, and uh, you know, do some meditation on the beach, meditation here, whatever, um, and really just let people come and chill out with you and just live with you basically for a weekend and just uh, no pressure, there's no course to actually get through, there's no, um, you have to know this by the end of the weekend, you have to do this by the end of the weekend, you must be here at a certain time, you must be here at a certain time, otherwise it's gonna stuff everybody up. There's no rush, there's no panic, you just come here and basically what we're looking at is um, I guess a seminar called Nothing. <laughs> it's about nothing really. When people ask you, what's it about? It's about nothing. <laughs> right? You just come along and you just chill out with us and you just get into our zone, our energy and so you come in with nothing but you leave with everything. You just, or you come in with everything and you leave with nothing. So your mind becomes totally clear. You've got a, a brand new uh, canvas to work on. You leave all your crap here and uh, we clean it up for you. <laughs> and um, 
and you just go home without any pressure and it's just a really laid back um, and you come for the energy and just to see what life can really be like and because we're doing it why can't everybody else do it there's there's no reason why people can't just live a um, in peace and relaxation rather than worrying about you know next week's um, income or uh, relationships and stuff I mean they're all very important things but when you're at peace with yourself then your life becomes peaceful that's what's that's what it's all about so anyway it's just just coming here or Hawaii or wherever we might hold some event um, and just really just relaxing and seeing how relaxing life can be and um, it's about nothing <laughs> uh, it'll, there'll be subtle changes over a weekend you notice little subtle changes like I say we had a little focus group just talk about things you want to talk about you can uh, talk individually or just one-on-one -on -one with somebody and just yeah just talk about your life talk about your story that's what it's all about it's talking about your story and learning it is just a story that's all it is yeah. I mean your life is your responsibility that's what I keep coming back to. So how did, how did you come about that uh, understanding of having a retreat or some sort of weekend or a week get together that way where you and I had even talked about it and I was thinking about the same kind of concept? Yeah, so did you say, how did it, oh yeah. So yeah, so how, yeah, how did it come about for you? Well, I guess um, there are so many courses out there and retreats where it's all very structured and you know you've got to do this you've got to do that and you've got to be here for meditation at sort of you know 4 30 a.m in the morning you must be there and they teach you things you have to learn things by the end of it and i thought well i'm the sort of guy i just want to go along and just um chill sometimes at, at a retreat not have any pressure to actually do anything and just to just to be present and have people come and and just see the energy that can be here with uh, like-minded people who are really on the same wavelength and uh, to come and sort of tap into that and as I say just go and do stuff like walk along the beach if you want to have a swim if you want to if you don't go and have a sleep whatever you want to do and just really chill out but mix with with people who are very I guess inspiring and want to inspire you to uh, you know improve your life to become a uh, to change your identity if you want to to become a per the person that you want to be and we'd be sort of here to help rather than um, have to go along to something that um, and you and I have both done courses over the years and it's just information overload and you have to do this and half the stuff you get home you're all motivated which I think I spoke I spoke about this on one of my vlogs uh, motivation and inspiration um, you get all motivated, you go to one of these events and you think, oh, this is fantastic, this is really great. Uh, you learn some stuff, you go home, you think, yep, I'm going to do this, this is just brilliant. Next day comes along, yep, I'll do this at some stage, yep. Next day comes along, oh yeah, that's a pretty good seminar, that one, yeah, yeah, okay. Back to my old life. And no nothing happens, nothing changes. So the guys that are running those seminars are making a fortune. But, and you're getting some information, but no one uses it because you're just motivated. You're not actually inspired. Uh, and when you're inspired, that comes from inside you. Whereas motivation comes externally, in my opinion. And uh, you need to be, uh, you need motivation for certain things, but as far as changing your life goes, you need to be inspired. It needs to come from you, not from some external thing. So by just by being sort of uh, present amongst people who are, you know, hopefully inspiring, and well, they certainly will be inspiring, and um, and just seeing how life runs easily on a weekend, and uh, how you can do it as well. I think, think that's better than going to some big rah rah weekend that really tries to pump all this information into you. You take it home. You got all all these CDs and cassettes and stuff, and um, well, not cassettes. So that's, <laughs> I'm showing my age there, Tone. <laughs> all these CDs and USBs you can plug in and stuff, and all these books and stuff. And you think this is fantastic. Oh, this this is me. And in two or three days, they're just sitting there. How many book How many books and courses are sitting in people's homes that they've been to, paid big money for, and done nothing with? Nothing. Nothing at all. I'm one of them. I'm one of those people, believe yeah, me. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so I figured just something where you can come along and not really 
have to sort of um, take notes and stuff, and uh, but just feel the energy, feel the presence, and just feel how you can really, um, I guess, feel the inspiration and be inspired rather than motivated. That's the that's the key to the whole thing for me. I think, yeah. just doing simple things, and we were playing around with the you know, the Seinfeld thing. It's look, it, it's it's a it's a retreat about nothing. <laughs> but, but what do you do there? Nothing. You just rock up. <laughs> but what do you leave with? Everything. everything. You leave with everything. Yes. Absolutely. Kevin. Yeah, that's a little, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your stories and being such an inspiration. Um, you know, it was absolutely worth the trip to come see you and to hang out with you over in this beautiful part of the world. And, and um, you know, it's just been such a, a pleasure to, to have you on the show. Um, where else, where can people uh, reach you again? How can they find you online? Um, oh, they can go to uh, smilingbodysmilingmind.com. That's uh, the website for the health and wellness stuff. They can find me on Kevin Spires TV on YouTube. Um, we've also got the, um, the Smiling Body, Smiling Mind YouTube channel, but that's all part of the, uh, the website as well. And uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Twitter, just, yeah, if you want to chat, please feel free, guys. Um, and it's been great having you here, Tone. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. And for the interview, it's uh, it's fantastic. And I'm sure it'll help a lot of people, I hope. And um, like I say, uh, I can't believe you're here. So uh, <laughs> to come all that way from, from where you are over in the States to Australia is just, that's very inspiring. So uh, I really appreciate that. Thank so thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs> hey, bud. Cool, man. Who are we? Oh, that went pretty quick. Right? That's the flow. That was cool.